of technological advancements like the drones to deliver vaccines to this uh, population that is uh, grappling the most uh, with the uh, insufficient availability of these uh, vaccines on the market. Well, thank you very much, Kovini Cheta. Like I did mention, yes, mm -hmm, we've lost over 85 million people this year alone, 2021, and that is a recipe uh, for disaster. You've had so many people who are, who are saying before, oh, we've only lost 5 million people all to COVID-19. Many people are saying we might lose over 50 million people. Guess what? 85 million people. If you to factor in the 35 million abortions, if you to factor in the 49.5 million deaths, or to maybe communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, uh, you do have alcohol that did claim 2.1 million deaths in 2021 alone. You do have smoking of cigarettes that has claimed over 4.2 million deaths in 2021 alone. Over 4 billion cigarettes have been smoked as we are speaking right now. Yesterday, that number was above 30 billion cigarettes being smoked by this small population of 7.9 billion people. That's how bad the situation is. And also to do with issues that have everything to do with health, we've also lost 260,000 mothers during the birth. And we've also lost 6.5 million young children under the age of five. That's how bad the situation is culminating into. We also do know that out of the 7.9 billion people who are roaming this earth, yes, only 5 billion are connected to the internet. That's how bad the situation is, meaning the whole African continent is uh, actually lagging behind. Over 2.3 billion Africans are not connected to the grid or somewhat a few are connected, but the majority are not on this grid. And that is a recipe for disaster in a pandemic where we are touting the importance or significance of actually maximizing on the power of the internet to be able to do the same. All right, Arthur Bainomagisha is joining me via Zoom. He is the executive director for the Advocates Coalition on Development and Environment. We want to talk about the squabbling between the Prime Minister, that is Robin Anabanja, and also the Minister for Disa Relief, Disaster Preparedness, and also and also refugees in that regard. We shall be talking about the squabbling that has been taking center stage uh, so far within this country. Hilary Onek is saying, well, Nabanja is usurping his powers. Uh, Nabanja is usurping Hilary Onek's ability to actually execute his duties. By June this very year, you did see uh, Honorable Nabanja in Kasese receiving an assortment for, of items that were going to be uh, distributed to some relief victims of climate change or flooding within that area. But then she actually rejected many of these assortments. She only accepted the 40,000 kilograms of poshu and 20,000 kilograms of beans, but then sent back the rest of the assortment of items that had been sent to that jurisdiction to help the individuals there, saying they were of substandard, they were substandard in that regard. So Hilary Onek is now talking about how he should have been the one in that position to handle all those issues. But Hilary Onek has been in power since 2014, and the question is what has been done by his docket to ensure that we do have alert systems within this country that actually go a long way in alerting individuals that there is a disaster on the horizon and they should be able to actually uh, help themselves in that regard. Uh, it's under Nabanja that we, are getting, we, that we are getting to learn that the National Meteorological Authority is giving us wrong information pertaining to the weather patterns and they are, and they are actually the culprits that have made it impossible for the farmers to actually predict the weather patterns in that regard. So that's why we are dealing with this problem of laziness within that docket. That's a word that is being used by the Prime Minister Robin Anabanje. It's not only the, it's not the only conversation we shall be uh, talking about with Arthur Bainomugisha. There is also the issue of Ethiopia. There is a state of emergency that was called within this jurisdiction. You do have advancing rebels. The Tigray People's Liberation Front are advancing. The secured two cities near Addis Ababa and they're now making their way to the main capital. It should be noted that this main capital Addis Ababa within Ethiopia has not seen any kind of fighting in that regard. Prime Minister has, uh, Abiy Ahmed has come out one too many times to say he is actually assuming victory of what actually took place within uh, Ethiopia, especially the Tigray region. He had one too many times said he had won that war but then the rebels regrouped and they're now advancing on the capital. While they were actually expediting those uh, campaigns against the rebels, we did see massive shelling on civilians. On this morning show, we would even talk about how Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, a Nobel Peace Laureate, could go a wrong way to oversee these human rights violations, even though he actually achieved that feat. All right, I have Arthur Banam on the line. 
A very good morning, Arthur. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, my brother. It's a pleasure to be hosted this morning. Arthur, by Nomigesha, it's been a while. What have you been up to first off before we get into the nitty gritties of this conversation? I've been working actually, and that's why I'm speaking to you and the nation from Kunjiri City. Mm. Uh, I'm in the field working uh, uh, to strength training local governments, inducting the district local councils. So my teams are spread all over the country, in inducting local councils which were elected and haven't been inducted to do uh, good business. Mm. Arthur, as of August this very year, 2021, over 54 NGOs were shut down, and these were operating in the spheres of governance and accountability. Your NGO is in that same sphere, which especially governance. Um, how did you survive the onslaught of the NGO bureau that was clamping down on these NGOs? No, you know, Accord is a public policy research think tank, and a think tank where we pursue uh, we, we, yes, we deal with politics, but we are non-partisan in the conduct of our business. We also do research, policy research. That's what informs our advocacy agenda. But I also try to comply, uh, uh, to comply with the law. Uh, it's unfortunate, of course, for our colleagues who, uh, which were, whose operations were shut. But I think uh, still as the, advo as the voices of the, of the citizens, as the agents that check, uh, that hold the government in check, we still need to uphold the rule of law to be able to demand also rule of law. Arthur, by Nomigeshe, on the shrinking civic space, many of these NGOs that were shut down were actually helping government to in actually advancing uh, public uh, service in that regard, or service delivery, if you will. Many of these NGOs were operating in those spheres, not only ac accountability and governance, but also other social spheres. In case of uh, landslides, you know, calamities, or to climate change, we've been seeing these NGOs come to the front line to help a government advance these social amenities to the people who are affected the most but then what we've been seeing from government is uh, another campaign expedited to shrink the civic space further why would government actually go against individuals who are going a long way or out of their way to help the government advance better social services Arthur I think uh, uh, yes NGOs and the government uh, play a complementary role uh, in terms of bringing services to our people and indeed, uh, a study that was done by uh, the NGO uh, forum some time back uh, demonstrates the economic and political contribution of NGOs in Uganda. We bring in a lot of needed cash uh, to we also complement government in offering service delivery. The NGO sector employs a multitude of many Ugandans. And uh, of course, we amplify the voices of the people and holding the government in check. And of course, uh, our operation is a constitutional matter. Chapter 4 of the Bill of Rights provides for our existence. Uh, but we, uh, NGOs, also must recognize that there's government and government regulates them. We have the NGO Act as amended. amended. We have the NGO Bureau. And uh, uh, we still need to operate within the ambit of the law in order to demand also to demand accountability from the government. Mm -hmm. But I also uh, uh, would want to advise both government and NGOs to recognize the important role that we play in the economic, economic transformation of the country and therefore do not compete. We should not be competing for space, but we should be, we should be working to complement each other because the work that is needed in this country in terms of development is so huge. Uganda is still listed as one of the least developed countries we have challenges, of course, of, of corruption. We have challenges of uh, poor service delivery. We are still an emerging democracy. So providing, of course, uh, an, a conducive environment to NGOs to grow is very, very critical uh, for government in order to allow that arm. Um, because the NGOs, we call ourselves the fifth estate, while the, 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 the media is the fourth estate, the NGOs are a fifth estate, and therefore complement government. So. Mm. It is unfortunate if government and the civil society or NGOs compete rather than complement each other. So I think moving forward, it would be important to, uh, for a conversation, to reach a conversation uh, uh, within the civil society leadership, between government and civil society leadership, to improve 
uh, working relationship. Arthur, by Nomagisha, it seems the competition has now veered away from the NGOs and uh, the government itself. Now the competition is between government itself and its officials. You do have the Prime Minister Robin Anabanja and Hilary Onek who are actually <laughs> tying a noose around each other's necks, saying, please, stay away from my docket. The other is saying, well, you are usurping my powers. W what are we looking at right now, Arthur, by Nomagisha, from the NGOs and now among us themselves? Well, thank you very much. Uh, and again, uh, to emphasize the whole uh, rationale, the whole uh, importance uh, of civil society, and here I'm talking about, of course, NGOs, I'm talking about CBOs, and the media, of course, the media is part of civil society. Indeed. If, if you have a very vibrant uh, uh, civil society in the country, they actually help to neutralize or to deal with what you see the bickering between the prime minister and the, and the and her ministers because you know in the when there is no uh, 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 check and balance when there is no when there is no uh, 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 habitat in this case the civil society then actually these people fo sometimes focus uh, uh, they focus they actually uh, they, they, they begin to compete among themselves <clears throat> what I see, of course, is unfortunate, uh, but uh, anyway, conflict is part and parcel of human life. And, uh, and I think uh, I, I, I also learned that the president has, uh, has uh, appointed the vice president to mediate in the conflict between the prime minister and Honorable Yedarunek. I hope that something good will come out. But as a, as a conflict specialist, conflict is part and parcel of human, uh, human life. But of course, uh, uh, but, uh, when conflict becomes very, uh, very strong and goes beyond reason, it can stifle service delivery. It can stifle uh, smooth operations of government. And I think uh, they need to improve their working relationships, but also uh, their methods of work. Uh, there's yes, indeed, the need to, for division of labor. And the, uh, I think a good leader also builds a team and delegates delegates so so uh, what i see is is is, is a uh, doesn't uh, doesn't scare me but is of course is is unfortunate especially when it comes into the public domain it shows uh, it shows the ugly side of what is happening there and i think they should have kept it to themselves uh, don't you think arthur by nomogisha this is a blessing in disguise i mean it's under prime minister nabanja that we did find out that uh, Yes, National Meteorological Authority was not giving us accurate numbers when it comes to the weather patterns. And it's also under the Prime Minister Robin Adabanja that we found out that the uh, docket for Hilary Onek was not working from 2014. If he was working, why do we have people in Bududa who are not resort resettled as yet? Every time a landslide befalls this area, people are actually killed, crops blanketed by the mud, and also these people are still talking about relocation in that regard. Kasese, they are still in the line of fire when it comes to flooding, meaning he, she has exposed the rot within this docket that is being manned by Hillary Onek. This squabbling seems like a blessing in disguise. I, I think, again, what we are seeing is, uh, one, uh, I think the people like Honorable uh, Hillary Onek and his team have been in this docket for a long time. And sometimes they make it a lifetime uh, uh, job, they create enclaves, and they don't want people to touch in their dockets. Uh, what we see, uh, while yes, we can be critical of Honorable Wonabanda being very revolutionary, very combative, her methods are different, uh, but she's the prime minister. She's a, a right honorable prime minister now, and I think she should not be bogged down by uh, I have worked under three prime ministers, because she has, it is her time uh, to also uh, make her mark in the leadership and I think she has a right to go to, to touch everywhere and make the, the office of the prime minister vibrant and work. I want to agree with you that we have seen a lot of challenges in the office of the prime minister. We don't forget that the, there has been scandal after scandal uh, uh, in that, especially in the refugee uh, department, embezzlement, corruption. And now uh, uh, the lady uh, comes in to to try and, 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 and make things work and deal with corruption mm. and then provide accountability. Of mm. course, she's bound to, uh, to face resistance. Mm. At the same time, I think uh, people, especially the men, must understand that uh, 
uh, okay, she's a leader, she has come that if we, if, if, even if Hillary will be right, mm -hmm. Hillary will be right, that this is a lady. People may construe his actions as actually insubordination based on gender. If I were him, I would humble myself and actually go and talk to the prime minister and, and establish a good working relationship. But most Ugandans are likely to discharge or judge uh, here and make that uh, uh, on the basis of gender relationship. But the, the fact that there has been a lot of growth in the office of the prime minister and the Honorable Naba, right Honorable Prime Minister is trying to make things move. I think uh, we need to give her the, all the support, all the support, and the, and, the, and the people need to subject themselves to authority. Well, of course, Arthur, by Nomukeshe, it's not only Hillary or next docket that has been bogged down by issues to do with laziness, complacency, and so forth. Other jurisdictions are also affected alike or all the same. What is to be done by government to improve uh, service delivery within this country, aside putting uh, or negating their squabbling? No, I, I think I, I, I just focused on the docket of, 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 of the minister, but, mm. you know, under, under the minister, there are other actually departments, including the one of disaster preparedness, but the entire government business, you know how it has been bogged down uh, 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 by, by, of course, inefficiency and, of course, corruption. Their ranking is not good, uh, and the, 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 the corruption index still ranks Uganda's one, 144 uh, position. It's not good, and uh, I think the appointing authority knew that Nabanda, honorable, uh, right Honorable Nabanda is a good loser, and I, and, I, and I think uh, that's what she is doing. And people must be brave for her methods of work. I think uh, for us who work with local government in terms of service delivery, you also see the quality of service delivery declining. Uh, so apparently, I think the first method will be to turn around the tables, and then I think she will settle down in the room once she has the right attitude to work, once she has good people, uh, or, people who are ready actually uh, to work and, off, and offer service delivery. There has been some complacency, and, the, and I think uh, that it is, it, it, it is good to have someone to wake us up uh, so that we can uh, wake up to the, real, uh, to the need to serve our people better. And with this COVID-19 that has ravaged the economy, that most people have lost jobs, the little money that we have must be used prudently uh, to, serve and, uh, to serve, to reach our people but also to be able to lift our people out of the, of the quagmire that has been occasioned on the country by COVID-19 and other, of course, challenges. And that as these officials continue to squabble, they should be vesting their energies instead in fighting corruption that has riddled this government with a lot of uh, bullets or holes, if you will. You have uh, the IGG who is telling us over 20 trillion Uganda shillings has been lost over the last decade uh, in unscrupulous ways. What do you make of this? How do we clamp down on this issue of corruption? No, actually, uh, corruption, of course, uh, is a two-way process. There are people who corrupt others, those who... Uh, who received the, the, the bribes, uh, but I think the greatest, the greatest uh, 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 the power, the strongest power center that needs to be sensitized as Ugandan citizens uh, to shun corruption, to expose corruption, and to be ready to stand up. It is a risky, uh, it's a risky uh, venture, especially when the corrupt become very powerful. I know that the, I think one of the challenges the whistle the whistleblowers act. People need to be protected those that volunteer uh, information, but there is also, so there is a need to create serious awareness about, uh, about corruption among the public, shun corruption, but also to demand accountability without fear or favor. It is also important for government to walk the talk and demonstrate uh, 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 its commitment by arresting the big fish, not only uh, charging them in courts and then after, after then giving, then afterwards to release them to enjoy the money, but selling their property, confiscating their property, and bring back uh, taxpayers' money into the, to the Treasury. I think where we have failed is the failure to recover the resources. People have died in jail, and but have died with their resources. All right, uh, Arthur, by Nomugeshe, please hold that thought. I'm going to get back to you. Please don't get off the line. We're just going for a short break, but we are returning shortly to talk about more on corruption, but also the unfolding corruption and humanitarian catastrophe within Ethiopia. The Tigray People's Liberation Front is advancing on the capital Addis Ababa. We want you to make help us make sense of what is happening within that jurisdiction. The show you are watching right now is Morning at NTV. 
Let's take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And before I revert to Arthur Bainamu the Executive Director for the Advocates Coalition on Development and Environment, would like to remind you, our beautiful viewers, about this very, very magical, yes, coffee, inspired Africa coffee. It's riddled with a lot of uh, magic within this small cup that we've got along with in resuscitating or reviving your body's creative processes. If you have that project that was stalling in terms of creativity, just sip on this cup of inspired Africa coffee and boom. <laughs> All the ideas will come streaming in like the River Nile. Away from that, you lesson also is an app that you could maximize on as a learner. Your father, mother are busy. Yes, they are working around the clock to ensure that they put food on the table. It's imperative that you as a learner take it upon yourself to go ahead with self studying It worked for us in the 1990s, even in the absence of you lesson. But you are in 2021 and you lesson is here as a blessing. You don't have to do it alone. They have to, uh, they are here to help you. You just have to be having a gadget some internet and in that regard you'll be able to get onto that platform and be able to continue with your education even in the absence of a teacher parent and so forth or tutor Arthur by Nomikisha is still with me we were talking about the issue of the squabbling in the prime minister's office and also Hillary on next docket that is the relief uh, disaster preparedness and refugees docket we also do know that corruption is eating up this society and the government alike to the that has been lost over the last 10 years so what needs to be down to clamp down on corruption. We cut off Arthur by Nomgisha when we went for a break, but he was still actually in the process of giving us some pointers on what needs to be done to alleviate this challenge. Before I take you back to Ethiopia and take a look at the carbonate in corruption and the humanitarian catastrophe as a result of the fighting. Um, you were still giving us pointers, Arthur by Nomgisha, on how best we can root, root out uh, the issue of corruption from our society. Is it possible or we should sh just simply sit back and shut up, Arthur? Because to every 20,000, within the market, 10,000 was acquired illegally. What do we do, Arthur? Should we just sh shut up? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, the, there has been, the culture of corruption has, uh, has increased and must deal with it. That's why I talked about conscientization of, of society. And I think that's where the, the civil society can come in to help government. The civil society uh, can, because ca government uh, cannot, uh, yes, uh, cannot, cannot be everywhere and therefore requires other actors uh, to support its cause. Uh, I know that the president has been in fact going to fight against corruption, but you can, this cannot be a long journey. So uh, again, uh, the, the relationship with civil society, if there is a conducive environment, civil society can play a very, very, very big role in curbing corruption. At the same time, of course, there's a need to strengthen the the anti-corruption uh, uh, agencies of government to be able to do their business. I know that uh, the IGG has been uh, has been complaining over under financing, uh, uh, but of course we understand that the economy is not doing well. Uh, uh, because I I was at, I was at a meeting where the Minister of Finance and the and the Secretary of the Treasury presented the budget estimates. Uh, they, they, the IGG has money. Uh, that can enable it to work within the, the limits of the, of the budget constraints they need to work. But they also need to strengthen the police, the CID, uh, to do investigation. Of course, you also know that the police also ranks now as one of the, uh, the most corrupt institutions. But uh, nevertheless, uh, not everybody, of course, is corrupt. There's a need also to strengthen uh, the police to do its job, especially the investigation arm of the police. Uh, there's a need, of course, also now to empower the ministry. We have the ethics, the minister of ethics. Uh, they need also to do their job. The they, they faith-based they, they faith organizations, Church of Uganda, the Catholic Church, the Muslim, all these need to be mobilized to say corruption is a cancer. Corruption kills. I know we may never be able to eradicate corruption, but corruption can be reduced to a level that does not cause actual even state corruption. You see, under control, Runaway corruption can lead to conflict and break down uh, uh, state corrupts. So we need to to be uh, to, to 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 really contain it to a level that it cannot stop stifle development, cannot lead to conflict and, and and violence in this society. So I think we need a concerted effort. We need to demonstrate the commitment by uh, uh, by arresting, but also recovering the the money, as I said. Uh, so that people may find it difficult or useless yes. to root 
public resources and, and enrich themselves. Uh, Arthur, by Nomigis, uh, the good news is that you're still saying that we need civil society, we need NGOs to come on board and help us root out corruption. Now, the fact that government is critical of the same NGOs that would have helped them clamp down on corruption, do you then agree with political commentators who say the action that they clamp down on NGOs or civil society is the biggest orchestration of corruption? In the 21st century, you do have a man who is beating his woman every day. And then the neighbors who are, you know, going out of their way to report the issue or even ask questions as to why this man is battering his wife on a daily basis are the ones who are being told, stay away. Do not focus on my issues. Isn't this the biggest corruption? They clamp down on civil society and the NGOs. I should also point out that uh, civil society is also not, uh, is, is, that is not uh, uh, free of corruption. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, there is also corruption in civil society, and that's why, of course, all of us have to be subjected to the rule of law. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, government also institutions that are in charge of regulation of civil society need to be empowered to mm. do that role. But as they do that role, they need to have the attitude of recognition of the contribution of civil society so that the relationship is not of fault finding but of empowering because you see some of the civil society organizations are young they are starting they need to be to be strengthened to reach a level where they can actually have strong financial management systems uh, hmm. structures so 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 i am saying that the, the that fighting corruption is two way while a civil society will touch and look for corruption in government government should also has also a right to make sure that NGOs are regulated because we are also staffed by the same people where we we we, we, suck, we have circled the same the same breast. So the corruption doesn't fear anyone. So why I'm saying we need that momentum as a country to shun corruption and know it's a cancer. It cannot allow us to achieve our environmental possibilities. Arthur, that in Arthur by Nomigisha, my next conversation will actually shine a light on how critical or how crucial NGOs and civil society really is. It's not the government of Ethiopia that told us that they were massacring innocent civilians within the, within the Tigray region. It was never uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's government. It was civil society. It was Amnesty International and many of these NGOs that came out and said, you know what? They are orchestrating the heinous human, uh, human rights violations within Ethiopia. It was never his docket or government. So largely help us make sense of what is happening within Ethiopia as the rebels continue to advance on the capital, Addis Ababa. What are we looking at? Now, of course, what is happening in Ethiopia is very, is very unfortunate for an African dream. We've been looking at Africa uh, as a rising power uh, to harness and take advantage of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia has been that beacon of hope. Perfect. Uh, uh, the, the late the, uh, Prime Minister Zenawi was part of the African story uh, when actually Albright, uh, uh, the former uh, Secretary of State of America, talked about uh, a new breed of leaders for Africa. Uh, and unfortunately, the new breed of leaders for Africa turned against each other. We saw the Sangani one and two uh, when, uh, when Rwanda and, and Uganda crashed in Sangani. We saw Ethiopia turn against Eritrea in 1998, 2000, about 100,000 people died. But anyway, uh, all the same, Ethiopia has been making a lot of progress. Uh, when Zenawa ascended to power in 1981, 1991, Ethiopia became stable, became prosperous, growing at an average rate of almost 10, over 10 percent. Uh, and it has been a signing example. And when, of course, I became to power, it was also, uh, uh, he was welcomed with a lot of optimism, and unfortunately, he has not lived up to that optimism. He has not pursued uh, political accommodation. I think, he, uh, uh, and, and now he has rocked the, the boat, uh, 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 and now Ethiopia is back at war. Yet it has been a stabilizing effect in the Horn of Africa, which has always been uh, war prone. So I'm not happy that our beacon of hope the third largest, uh, the, actually the second most populous nation in the in Africa, is 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 at is at war. When actually the rest of Africa was thinking that Ethiopia would pull up some of the African countries that are struggling. Well, of course, the most disturbing issue about this conversation, Arthur, by Nomigisha, pertains to the fact that you, this is a Nobel Peace Laureate, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. And how can you even orchestrate the most heinous human rights violations as a human, 
you know, as a peace laureate. Um, that's what many people are asking themselves. And it also uh, begged to start another conversation on how critical should we be talking about the creation of an African standby force. Whatever is happening in the Central African Republic, Somalia, you do have Niger, Chad, Mali, you do have countries that are grappling with jihadist insurgencies. Um, we also do have Nigeria and what is happening within Sudan. Shouldn't we be talking about right now an African standby force that could be called upon whenever we have such problems to enter and quell the situation, not only running to the mercy of the international community. When you run to the U.S., they won't do much militarily to intervene. They will just say we are suspending the Africa Growth Opportunities Act, AGOA. You understand what I mean? To put pressure on these governments, and it's not enough. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, you see, it, the salvation for Africa, the government of Africa, emancipation for Africa must come from the Africans themselves. I can assure you that the rest of the world wants a very divided, collapsed, disorganized Africa for, uh, in order to come and actually uh, and exploit our, our rich mineral resources. So uh, uh, Africa must realize that we, uh, that we do not have uh, friends uh, uh, in the international community, especially the developed North. They have always looked for opportunity actually to bring down the rising uh, Africa and so, uh, so I do not expect them to help us even here. And uh, you know, for example, one of the challenge and that one of the challenges you realize that actually under Trump, Trump had allied with Egypt and Sudan to to actually to stop Ethiopia from uh, from completing the Renaissance Dam, the or, or the Renaissance or the Millennium Dam that Ethiopia has been constructing, which if if completed will generate about six thousand megawatts of electricity which can be very useful in powering industrialization across much of Africa. Uh, so uh, uh, they talk about the, the African standby uh, force. That's one of the interventions that we could do, but uh, I think uh, it alone does not complete the picture. I think what Africa needs to be done uh, uh, is to, uh, one, uh, to deal with the root causes of these conflicts, because some of these conflicts are very perennial they have been around. For example, we know that Ethiopia is a conflict-prone country, and as such, I think uh, the message that the, uh, that the, that the Abe has, uh, Prime Minister Abe has done is failure to accommodate uh, other ethnic groups. When the TPLF came to power, they, under, they experimented what is called ethnic uh, federalism. Ethnic federalism was a project aimed at dealing with the ethnic nationalism or tribalism to bring it really home. Tribalism that has always uh, made Ethiopia fail to, 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 to progress. So they formed a coalition of four parties that were, uh, and, and of course with TPLF as a leader. And that coalition helped Ethiopia stabilize and to prosper. What this man did, uh, Ahmed, was to dismantle that coalition, and, and yet it's the one that uh, catapulted him into power dismantled it and formed the prosperity party, uh, which he controlled, and then, and then pursued decentralization as opposed to decentralization or federalism. That has, uh, but also pursued the TPLF leaders, that they are corrupt. His reforms could be seen that uh, really he did not recognize or appreciate where TPLF had brought Ethiopia from. I think it's a shame to the peace ruling uh, he, did no, he only made peace with Eritrea, only to use Eritrea to massacre uh, the people, because Eritrea is under the worst dictatorship that Africa has seen. So his alliance with the Eritrean forces that have committed rape and mass murder uh, in, Tigray, in, in Tigray really is a shame on his conduct uh, of, of business, and it's also a shame in Africa. But it's always not lost. I think the, the, the African Union, the African Union should intervene and they try to bring these warring parties uh, uh, to the table. I know that the, uh, the Tigrinians are pushing towards Ethiopia, but their takeover with Ethiopia will not solve the problem. It will actually, it could actually, uh, uh, it could usher in a complete collapse of the Ethiopian state, and of course, which will affect the entire Sub-Saharan Africa, because you have refugees, you have refugees, you have small arms proliferating here, and in the time of COVID, spreading COVID, but also other economies may not manage the refugees. I imagine Uganda may not be able to cope with the, with the refugees, even if we have the best uh, refugee policy 
in Africa or in the world. Uh, let's, let's also talk about the AGOA Act, the Africa Growth Opportunities Act that was suspended by the U.S. It was suspended in Sudan and also Guinea, Mamadi Dumbuya's jurisdiction. How will it go a long way in helping collapse these economies? Because this money was helping them so much. The suspension of AGOA. Unfortunately, the AGOA has not been a success story when it comes to Uganda. I think uh, in Uganda, I've not, I don't think it means much uh, to us. Uh, uh, maybe we have not taken advantage of Agoa, but Ethiopia had taken advantage of Agoa. Uh, their textile industry is well advanced and they have been exporting textile uh, to the United States without those hindrances and with those uh, 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 privileges. So it will affect certainly the suspension of the Equal Opportunities Act, African Growth and Equal Opportunities Act uh, in the part of Ethiopia will affect its economy. Uh, and, uh, it needs that kind of money, uh, but it also shows the double standards of, of, the, of the U.S. It shows the double standards hmm. of the U.S. Just like the U.S. cut and run in Afghanistan, we see them cut and run in the face of a conflict in Ethiopia. They should play a leading role. In, uh, uh, the U.S. has been in South Sudan. All right, Arthur. Thank you very much for that humble submission, Arthur by Nomogisha. Always a pleasure uh, talking to you. You come with a wealth of information. Let's just work out some more time next time so that you can acquaint us with the latest information. He is calling out the double standards of the U.S., uh, reference of Afghanistan when they ran out, and also the cutting of funds in his way of thinking as Arthur. It's running away from the problems. They need to actually stand up and fight with the Africans if they really care about the African jurisdiction. Well, my name is Romeo Busik.